before you exsanguinate yourself financially and get yourself a business class seat in automotive hell, let's identify the top 20 worst cars in Australia and the cars you should buy instead. So step away from the checkbook and do not walk calmly out of the dealership. Run. There are a million different new cars on sale in Australia. A million, or so it would seem. There's actually about 300. And there's a million new car review websites as well, dripping in uninformed and or irrelevant comment. Most of them are written by car nuts with a limited capacity for journalism, and they're writing for other car nuts as opposed to actual car buyers like you. All these dipshit reviews really tell you is what a car looks like and how it drives. But shock horror, there's more to owning a car than that. How it looks and how it drives. Please, if you're actually going to spend your own money on a car, it's dead easy to fall in love, pay the big bucks and get bitten on the ass by poor reliability or worse, resale value. And these two often attack in concert with abysmal customer service from manufacturers because there are absolutely inadequate lemon laws here in Australia, and that is something that must change. I mean, you can buy a Jeep in America with impunity. If it's a lemon, you just take it back and you are protected by robust lemon law legislation in the USA. If your car ticks the lemon box, you get a refund or a replacement. Not so here in Australia. If you own a lemon, a morally bankrupt car maker is essentially free to treat you like shit. It's often the car industry's standard operating position. And this is disgraceful. This video is mainstream car buying advice for mainstream car buyers. So the pillars of irrelevance like Ferrari, Aston Martin, Jaguar, Bentley, Maserati, Lamborghini, Porsche, Rolls Royce, good luck with that. Even Lotus and Tesla, really? Not a good idea, not actually a plan. You are on your own there. Millionaires and shallow celebrities form an orderly queue on the right. There's nothing for you to see here. At least you'll be able to afford the flatbed truck when your Ferrari carks it on the freeway. So that's nice. Okay, for everyone else, it's vital you make the right choice up front. Stack the deck in your favour by buying the best options, as opposed to the riskiest. Buy a car with solid fundamentals from a company that will treat you fairly if anything goes wrong. So with that in mind, let's hack and slash the market like it's 1999. We're going to do ourselves a favour and lose all the freaks in one hit. The cars that simply do not sell in sufficient numbers or with enough credibility to deliver you a reasonable support network. The ones that might be gone tomorrow. The tryhards. And this means Haval? Who? Not so smart. Proton, Great Wall, Cherry, LDV, Sanyong, Photon, etc. Face facts you already know these brands are a bad idea. Sideshow exhibits at best. The bearded ladies of the car industry, fine to look at, even oddly titillating. Not that you'd ever admit it, but don't do it. You will hate yourself in the morning if you do. Next, you have to axe Infiniti, Peugeot, Citroen, Volvo and Mini. They just have to go. Do not buy one if you know what's good for you. I mean, Infinity is still a joke. Buzz Lightyear's motto. Infinity is Nissan's Pamela Anderson, minus any accumulated Lexus like cachet, with costs out of control and little, if any, real luxury. And they managed to sell a lot less than Infinity, about 45 a month on average in Australia. So good luck at trade-in time. Good safety tip there, buy a Lexus instead. Citroen's a nice idea, but fewer than 100 a month get sold in Australia. There's a tiny market for these things and that impacts directly on everything that matters. The number of dealers, the spare parts inventory, the technical support, alternative service providers, things like that. Resale value. 
Peugeot is the same thing, more sales than Citroen, but definitely not enough for critical mass. I mean, Porsche outsells Peugeot, despite the decimal point being one hop over to the right. And Volvo is a Peugeot-esque joke as well, with about the same sales and therefore a lousy support network. The Chinese bought Volvo from Ford during the global financial crisis and they did it for the safety tech, not to make Volvo a screaming commercial proposition. And finally, Mini, the not quite a BMW BMW that's offered in so many variants it'll make your head spin. But sales have evaporated. Reliability is circling the dunny. I love that word, it's an Australian idiom. And you will not be adequately supported if you buy one. I know, it's a real shame because you binge watched the Italian job last night. Michael Caine's one and then Mark Wahlberg's. And now you want a Mini. It's still a bad idea. Let's do three in one hit, Chrysler, Jeep and Dodge, for the sake of efficiency. Hell, let's make it five by adding Fiat and Alfa Romeo. You cannot be serious if these lemons are on your list. New Chrysler 300, very gangster. SRT8, breathtakingly quick. Jeep, the off-road icon. The SRT, Jeep Grand Cherokee, awesome to drive. Breathtaking, and not in a Volkswagen way. Dodge has no redeeming features except it's cheap, but Fiat's cute and has a touch of Milan catwalk about it, despite being made in the potato liquor capital of the universe, Poland. And Alfa Romeo, the world's sexiest affordable cars. Fair enough, many awesome to drive and all great looking cars in these stables. Carnal attraction, a go-go, I get it. But let's put our rational brains in gear. Fiat Chrysler Automobiles is the most complained about car company in Australia as a proportion of vehicles sold, and it does all of those brands. It's the hot chick who wants it bad 24 seven, but you've got to lock the knives away. Don't take my word for it. The complaint statement is according to a recent statement made by Rod Sims, the boss of the ACCC. This means two things. A, the vehicles are unreliable shitboxes, and B, the company and its dealer networks have a finely developed track record of acting like Hannibal f***ing Lecter when it comes to resolving your problems. And if that's a ring you feel like stepping into, you're a nut. I cannot help you there. Many of these vehicles are gorgeous and all great to drive, just right to lust after, but very bad to own. According to consumer reports in the USA, fully one quarter in its recent 20 least reliable cars list for 2015 come from this pentagram from hell stable of poor choices. Chrysler, Jeep, Dodge, Fiat and Alfa Romeo are non-starters. You really need to lay off the crack pipe if you think it's still a good idea to buy a Volkswagen, Audi or Skoda. I get absolutely that you might not feel inclined to be outraged over their unconscionable decision to contribute illegal levels of poison into the air you breathe, but trust me on this, they are sociopathic motherfuckers for doing it. But even if we sweep all of that evil behaviour to one side, look at this like a purely commercial proposition. Resale value of used Volkswagens, Audis and Skodas has tanked. And Skoda is a joke in any case. It fails the relevance test like Volvo or Peugeot. Skoda sales are a joke, a long, long way from critical mass. But the other two, you don't know what next apropos of the Dieselgate scandal. Nobody knows the extent of the financial hit to the organisation, how much the massive fines are going to be, plus the cost of the class action lawsuits. Nobody knows if the scandal will suddenly get bigger and possibly engulf the car you might buy. Buying a Volkswagen Audi or Skoda right now is a dumb commercial decision. In three years time, they could be even more on the nose than now, out the back door, whatever. You're just not thinking rationally if you still want to buy one. Like, even if the whole system bounces back and there's no further dieselgate fallout, you buy one today and fast forward three to five years. So you're selling it, right? 
potential buyer looks at the compliance plate and then it's up to you to convince that buyer your car was not part of the scandal. Good luck with that, without looking defensive. The Ford Focus and Fiesta are big and little brother disgraces. They have the world's dodgiest dual clutch transmissions, worse even than Volkswagen's. Each unit has been personally cursed by Satan himself and Ford in Australia has worked very, very hard and very, very consistently in direct consultation with Lucifer himself to burn thousands of owners with not just bad, but disgracefully abhorrent customer service. These transmissions fail routinely. They shake like one does coming down from a three-week amphetamine binge and the dealer network runs you around like you're part of some three-ring circus. In the first ring, they tell you, it's normal. The transmission just needs to chance to adapt up to your driving style. It's shaking like a friggin' epileptic fit. Then you step up to ring two after several more complaints and they reprogram the transmission. This consumes your valuable time, of course, but it doesn't help. And then you get to ring three with your sanity hanging by a thread nearing your wits end. They replace the clutch packs. Miraculously, this solves the problem. There's a brief moment of Ford ownership euphoria for six to eight weeks. So that's nice. But this orgasmic infusion of Ford's smooth transmission joy is perhaps the cruelest part of the Focus Fiesta ownership experience. Because just when you've closed the door on this bleak automotive chapter of your life emotionally, and you're driving off into the sunset, that slut of a transmission starts to fail again. And you're suddenly teleported back to step one. Fiesta and Focus, both recognised by consumer reports in the USA as two of the 20 least reliable cars, the second worst and 11th worst respectively. They're the groundhog day come true proposition of shit transmission ownership. Three classic alternatives, Mazda 2 beats Fiesta hands down every day, and Hyundai i30 or Mazda 3 are rock solid alternatives to that shitbox focus. The Holden Cruise and Captiva occupy a special place in the hearts of many Australians. The place of the beloved child who grows up to become a serial murderer. That moment when the hot chick you've wine dined and danced in Bangkok comes back to your hotel room and turns out actually to be a young man. That kind of place. These two vehicles are non-fiction versions of Stephen King's book, Christine. Chucky with four wheels and an engine. Nurse Ratchet with an ignition key instead of an axe. These two vehicles were designed, if that's the right word, at a time when GM was on the fast track to bankruptcy and the fundamental R&D was so poorly done that the vehicles don't just drip with faults, they overflow. It's the gestalt theory of faults in play. The whole is much worse than the sum of the shit design. Product Safety Recalls Australia drowns with safety related recall notifications for these evil dizygotic Holden twins. And no matter how many times they break or burn or fail, they still manage not to die. I'm being flippant about this, sure, but my inbox overflows at time with the absolutely anguished owner emails concerning this pair of cursed Holdens. Because Holden is just as shit at customer service with its accursed twins as Ford is with its pair. Despite slashing the price, the desperation move when it comes to holding onto sales, the Cruise is selling 10,000 fewer units annually today than it was five years ago. If you think either of these two vehicles is a good idea, change the medications you're on because the real world is no longer getting through. Instead of a cruise, you're a dick if you don't buy a Mazda 3 or a Hyundai i30. The Captiva 5 is a laughing stock compared with a Mazda CX-5. And the Captiva 7 is a lot cheaper than a Hyundai Santa Fe or Kia Sorento in logarithmic proportion to the better quality of the Hyundai and Kia. If you're on a budget, you'd be better off in a Nissan X-Trail or a Mitsubishi Outlander. The Holden Commodore, Ford Falcon and Ford Territory are vehicles that nobody wants, statistically. Demand for these three has fallen off a cliff. 
The factory is closing in both cases and every worker is losing his or her job imminently. And you still wanna buy a car built in this environment? Really? The only thing you can count on here is breathtaking depreciation. You've got to be kidding. Territory is the Joan Rivers of SUVs. It's what happens when you keep a vehicle on sale long past its use-by date and instead of investing in its fundamentals, the R&D, you just keep mainlining Botox. The three vehicles are poor quality depreciation disasters. And you have to remember there are two ways to lose a ton of money on a car. You can pay too much for it up front or it can depreciate like a stuck pig while you own it. You are guaranteeing a depreciation disaster with these threes. So where do we start? Instead of these antiquated shit boxes, look at a Mazda 6 or a Subaru Liberty or Outback for family transport. If you want to go fast from A to B, a Subaru WRX or WRX STI absolutely murders one of these dinosaur V8s. And a Hyundai Santa Fe or Kia Sorento would both be territory killers. If old age hadn't already hammered the final nail in territory's coffin about five years ago. To me, the Nissan Pathfinder exemplifies what happens when someone falls asleep at the wheel. Because trust me, someone fell asleep at the wheel at Nissan about 10 years ago, and they haven't woken up yet. It's wall-to-wall -wall Rip Van Winkles in the Nissan boardroom. Suzuki and Honda are doing the same thing, but Nissan rates a special mention because it's tanked its former reputation for reliability in this we're all asleep process. For years, you know, I went to Pathfinder launch after Pathfinder launch. Good value, rock solid, decent tow platforms, great family wagon, camping, fishing, adventure, versatility, like that. And now there's this shitbox, which looks just as bad as Hyundai's so-called fluidic sculpture. Remember that. It's also thrown Pathfinder's former strengths into the nearest composting toilet. Reliability generally is appalling, but the CVT transmission is an epic engineering disgrace. It rates a special mention. It slips, vibrates, jerks, does everything wrong. In short, it does everything you don't want a production transmission to do. And the joke here really is on Nissan because that transmission is built by Jatco, which is 75% Nissan owned. So don't buy one of these awful Pathfinders based on a positive past experience with a decent previous Pathfinder. It won't be a happy union. Hyundai Santa Fe or Kia Sorento is the go here as an alternative. Fundamentally better vehicles with fundamentally better ownership arrangements as well. Mercedes-Benz is off its meds. Everyone still wants the three-pointed star. Allah knows why. People expect a Mercedes-Benz to be so much better than other cars in so many different ways, and yet they're not. A Benz is better in only one way. It has the three-pointed star. People are gonna see you driving a Mercedes-Benz. Degree of shallowness, 13 out of a possible 10. 6.5 stars from the three-pointed star out of a possible five. Mercedes-Benz has only ever been good at one thing, making big fat barges for big fat German heads of state, big fat captains of industry, and lean, hungry drug cartel CEOs. A cheap Benz, however, is just that. It's cheap and a Benz. So instead of sticking to their guns and doing what they do best, these all-conquering Teutonic dickheads at Mercedes-Benz overdosed on testosterone one day and decided to start competing with the Japanese, who let's face it, are a lot better at building affordable cars. When you look at Benz's product range, it's bigger than Ben-Hur. It's dripping with cheap shitbox Benzes though, lunching off Mercedes-Benz's long-term cachet. Take the flagship Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Back in 2000, they sold 660 S-Classes in Australia, ranging from 166 grand to about 320. And that's an average of just shy of a quarter of a mil, or just shy of 400,000 in today's money. Benz is in fact only selling half as many S-Classes here today 
and the average price is about 50,000 less in real terms. So there's the evidence that they're selling out the brand. They've traded exclusivity for volume and the range is increasingly dominated by cars mere mortals can afford. And what happens when you do that? The product starts to fall apart, which is exactly what my last two don't buy recommendations exemplify. Consumer reports in the USA, they say the C-Class and the GL-Class Mercedes-Benzes are in the 2015 top 20 least reliable cars list, amazingly enough, in positions 20 and lucky 13 respectively. Independently determined and verified off the back of almost three quarters of a million surveyed new car owners. The C-Class is developing quite the reputation for power steering failure. The infotainment system fails as well, plus it rattles and stalls at idle. Not exactly traditional Benz selling points, are they? The official Mercedes-Benz tagline for the C-Class is, quote, this changes everything. And I guess if you experience any or all of those common C-Class faults, it probably does. The GL-Class Mercedes-Benz is apparently even worse. Benz calls it, quote, King of the Jungles. <laughs> but only because Shitbox Tronic was already trademarked. The collision warning sensors are, apparently, cactus. The blind spot sensors fail, and so does the power steering and the display screen. The infotainment system is great, except it decides randomly not to inform or entertain you. The Bluetooth was also designed by the Russians, apparently, and the voice recognition system works like the rest of the infotainment apparatus, so it's awesome too, except if you expect it actually to recognise your voice. That's pretty much the main course of documented GL class routine failures. But there is a little garnish on the side, a little something special. You'd expect that from Benz. What you actually get is rattles in the doors and tailgate, and just wait until that magic moment when the seven speed automatic transmission decides randomly it's going to be a single speeder from here on in. Didn't need the other six speeds. The magic of shitbox tronic that could be interesting you know but only for the first 15 or 20 meters and the engine control ecu sometimes needs reflashing as well so enjoy ruling that jungle in your shitbox a-class loan car while the dealership is repairing your king again so in summary if you're a shallow dick Step right up. There's a Mercedes-Benz dealer near you just gagging to sell you one of these Jungle Kings or the car that changes everything or any other cheap Mercedes-Benz that's actually screwed together nearly as well as a South Korean Holden. Or you could just buy a BMW. You know, even the South African built 3 Series is a better option than that shitbox everything changer. You can contact me at autoexpert.com.au and I'm expecting a lot of hate mail off the back of this revelation. We get new cars cheap and in the spirit of equality, should you decide you ultimately want a Pathfinder or a Focus or a Cruise or even a Jungle King, I'll help you with that too. But don't come whining to me when it boils the kid's bunny. Leave a comment below, let me know what you think and subscribe for regular updates. I'm John Cadogan, thanks for watching.